Portrait Artist of the Year, Season 6, Episode 6. I'm going to introduce some new features here. Let's get started. But please, if you would consider leaving a thumbs up and maybe subscribe to the channel, that would be terrific. Now let's go. I'll introduce the new features in a moment, but first let's follow the regular format. We get to see the artists and the portraits that they did, where they had unlimited time. These are the portraits that they submitted in order to be selected to be on this program. There will be nine painters in each episode. From that, we will have three that are finalists of each episode, and then only one goes on to what they call the semifinals, which usually ends up being um, episode uh, eight, eight or nine, I can't remember. But everybody's a good painter here, so this, this could be quite exciting. Um, I like to see how people decide to show who they are. This one, is this he's a storyteller, right? He's got a lot to tell us about, oh, I don't know, I'm just guessing maybe his family. Uh, I, I enjoy making a backstory for things. So this, I think, is going to be a really good episode. There's great variety in the painters, and, um, and so that's good to see. Now, that being said, I always watch the program with the sound off because uh, I don't like to be influenced by the judges and it does not enhance my experience to see the see or hear the judges. <laughs> Many of you have shared that sentiment. But first, let's look at some references. I often reference these things, and I'm going to do that later in this episode recap, uh, but I wanted to give some pictorial examples of those references that I make. I'm often talking about something called a color value swap out. And I know you know what that is. I just wanted to also say that it's a concept that's been around for a very, very long time. And the absolute master of it, I think we all know, is this fellow who needs no introduction. I mean, this is such an example of color value swap out. Every single stroke is not a different color, but not color, they're not flesh tones for the most part. There are greens, there are reds, there are oranges, there are violets, there are peaches. There are just what he does is he looks at the value of something, in other words, how light or dark it is, and instead of inserting the color that your eye would see, he inserts the color with the correct temperature and value. And here's a modern artist, I mean a contemporary of ours, who does the same thing. This is David Lobenberg. He, I think he was known, um, he does a lot of teaching online and, and I think was known for his illustrations back in the day, especially in magazines. But look at that. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a color value swap out. There is absolutely no flesh tone in there at all. But the reason you believe it as an image is because he got the values right. And that's what we're going to talk about later. Now, David Hockney maybe is not known by everybody, although if you're in the UK, of course you know who he is. Although he did end up in latter years in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, here he is at, in his latter years in front of some of his portraits. We're going to have a painter coming up who is obviously influenced by David Hockney. And here is an example of, he's known for these swimming pool paintings, and just great design. But there is a certain feeling you have when you see David Hockney's palette, and clearly a, a painter in this episode has, has been influenced by him. And the last artist I want to share is Fairfield Porter. Fairfield Porter has been a favorite of mine. He might even be one of the reasons I started painting in the first place. I think this is the painting that he's best known for, and that's maybe because it's, it's a classic Maine image, you know, the state of Maine in the United States. And also it was used as the cover of um, L.L. Bean. <laughs> it's been reproduced just over and over and over again in, in lots of tourism kinds of, um, uh, what do you call it, venues. So here's an example of what he does. And when I talk about minimalism, what I'm talking about is where you get the impression. It's, it's that place which is in between. It's, it's, you can tell that there's realism there, but it's just would, wouldn't take much, much to nudge it into the abstract. So it, it is so based on really, really good design more than 
you know, um, more than, oh, you know, did he get that hand right? Did he get that eye right? And I'm always conscious of that. I'm always really looking at good design. So we are going to talk about those concepts today. So our first one up is Zowie Ashton. She is an actor, writer, and director. So she is going to uh, sit there for four hours, which must be quite excruciating. I don't think I've have I ever sat still for four hours? I doubt it. Um, I'd have to be strapped down. Uh, but anyway, um, so there she is. And the artists, four hours into their experience, only a few minutes into the program, we get to see what they've worked on. And she is going to select one of these paintings to take home with her. So here's the first one up. It's a very bold painting. And this does emphasize design. Look at all the negative spaces being experimented with behind her. Uh, so I, I'm really appreciative of that. It's it's bold in its colors and it's gold, bold in its representation. And, you know, uh, it looks pretty darn good. Now we're going to pull back because I think it's important always to pull back because uh, the winning artist is going to do a commission for a major gallery. So it's it's got to read not just as a piece would in your home, but, you know, an institution. It's going to be surrounded by other paintings that, that fit that criterion as well. He obviously didn't have enough time to finish, but, um, but everything he's done is, is really solidly done. So that's exciting. Good job. Okay, here's the next one up. Um, this, looks, this looks good. Uh, I, I, you know, for my voice, it sounded a little qualifying there. It's, it's not as bold in terms of color. It's... Um, um, yeah, yeah, you know, I just, I, I just wish there had been one or two color value swap outs somewhere in the face. The face ends up being pretty monochromatic overall, and that's probably what he saw, but if you make a color spot of value that enhances color, you can get something really exciting happening. And that's what the person is trying to do here, and uh, with some amount of success, but it, this painting never got fully realized. Although we'll pull back, I think, it, and get a better idea. Um, I like the color choices. This is a tough one for me. You know, it's, it's because it's, it's, it's broad in some ways, which makes me say, yay, this is a really brave painter. And then, you know, this, this eyelash thing going on. I'm thinking, wait, is it that you can't decide whether you're a minimalist and you really want to be a maximalist? Or... Are you just seeing things that, that, that my eye would skirt over? I don't know. But something about, oh, no, okay, we turn, our, turn away. See, now that's not holding up for me as, we, we, uh, as, as soon as we get fairly far away from it. Yeah, just the identifying value shapes just don't anchor it in, in as well as, I, as some other painters have. So she's going to pick one to take home with her. I don't know which one she picks. Um, let's see. She's got some, she's got a nice, nice feel to choose from. So let's see which one she picks to go home. Oh, she picked that one. Well, I'm, I'm surprised, but, uh, but it's in her home, not in mine. And art is subjective. And thank goodness for that. If we all like the same thing, wouldn't that be a sad day? Now the next, um, model up is Adrian Dunbar. And Adrian is an actor and director. Ah, all right. They placed him in front of a kind of wild background, so that's interesting. And well, he's doesn't this one doesn't look too challenging to me. And in some ways, he has a very, very symmetrical face. But but sometimes you really want to have more character you can kind of dig into. There's almost a blandness to his face. All right, turning the easels around now, we get to see what the artist did. This looks pretty good so far, um, but but more will be revealed. Oh, now, now that's a drawing on wood. That's interesting. I didn't ever get a good shot of this from far away. I will, I will before I finish this episode, but... But it's a nice drawing. I don't know the reasons for putting it on the wood panel. They always explain that during the program. But like I said, I watch it with the sound off because I don't... You know, in the end, I'm, I'm looking at the art. That's what I'm interested in. Um, I don't care how you get to the end of a painting. Just, I want to look at the art. 
Um, that's an interesting one as well. Although, you see what I'm talking about with color value swap outs? You know, you could have put, you could have put a little bit of red in those darker areas, for example, or a little bit of violet. Staying in the same value, matching the value to the, every single one of those values that's already there, but inserting some pure color instead. And that takes mixing. That takes mixing and making lots of color dabs on the side so you can match the value to the color dab and then successfully make those marks because it has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, you know, in terms of its value pattern, then, um, then things become chaotic. And I think we have one coming up where that is exactly the case, which is why I wanted to talk about that at length today with some examples. So here, oh, this is the one that I feel is very, very influenced by David Hockney's paintings. Not just the way it's presented in terms of its simplistic forms, but the actual color palette. I feel like he picked up David Hockney's colors and used them. And I don't have a problem with that at all. You know, he'll, I'm sure he has a body of work that's quite different from David Hockney's, but it reminded me right away of, of that famous artist. And we're all influenced by the different things that we see. And even if we're influenced by the different things we see, we all end up with, I want to say, the style we deserve. I might want to paint like Andrew Wythe, but that's not my style. All right, Adrian Dunbar's pick. Let's see which one he picks. Um, and again, I have no idea. Let's take a look. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. I'm taken aback. I did not expect, uh, boy, I wouldn't have picked this one. I would have picked the David Hockney one. So I don't know his reasons, but it was his, his decision. So there we go. And when we do get to see that uh, drawing on wood from far away. The next uh, model up is Ricky Wilson, an American guitarist, and was in the band the B-52s. I only remember a beehive and something like Love Shack having to do with the B-52s. So there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not dressed in the in the stage clothes that I remember the B-52s being in, but which was sort of retro and almost Pee Wee Herman-ish. Anyway, four hours in, the artists turned their easels around. Oh, um, I'm not I'm not looking forward to talking about the first one that we see in front of us, but but um, I volunteer for this job, so I shall do so. Um, okay, well. Um, Love the color choices. Really don't like the uh, proportions of the face. It's off. It's off. The eyes are too close together. There, there's some issues here. Um, better. Oh, okay. Better from better from far away. Actually, it's a bit of a gem from far away. Yeah. Now I changed my mind. That looked. Uh, that worked very, very well. I do remember his piece uh, at the beginning, which was an absolutely beautiful painting of, of himself. So he, he does have the skills. I don't know why I was overwhelmed on first look. It's a little, oh, this one I continue to be underwhelmed by. This is almost um, a, a blue and orange painting. Now, it's smart to do blue and orange because you're dealing with complementary colors. You can get your best contrasts. But the problem for me is if you squint your eyes, the value of the background and the values within the hair, every, there's, a, there's just not a broad value range. You've got some darks, you mostly have mid-tones, and the only lights really left are, well, maybe some skin tones and the rest of the canvas. It's, it's, um, it's just not as strong as some of the other pieces that have come along, and that has to do with the value. Now, this is the one that I, I really wanted to talk to a bit. Um, this is a total color value swap out. Remember I talked earlier about how if you make correct value choices in terms of how light or dark your color is, you can have a painting that reads as if it, you know, it makes sense. Whereas this one, it, it, for me, it doesn't. He's made all the color value swap outs, but they aren't anchored in a clear strategic value pattern for me. From far away, I like it better, but it, it, it's, um, I just like it in particular if you can do a kind of a mix of both traditional painting and color value swap outs as well. This is leaning a little too far in the color value swap out direction. 
Uh, now, Van Gogh did it beautifully, but as we all know, there aren't many Van Goghs in this world. <laughs> Everybody wants to be, but, uh, but there was only one. And he didn't want to be one. Oh, poor guy. I'll always feel for Van Gogh uh, for so many reasons. Oh, so this is one he chooses to take home. Okay, well, that's a really unusual palette, too. I can honestly say I have none of those colors. They're quite electric, and, and that, that I don't have any of that on my palette. All right, the judge be begins. This is when all the artists are lined up after hours and hours and hours of travel and, and being at this venue and painting all day with lights and cameras on you. I would be in a fetal position, absolutely comatose, <laughs> but, but that's not the choice. So the first one up is this one, the David Hockney inspired one, which I find really exciting. No one's painted like this. Oh, and there's David Hockney in front of many of his portraits. See how similar the color range is to David Hockney? Um, I just wanted to show that. And, and talking about it is not the same, you know, showing is not the same as, no, let me, telling is not the same as showing, yeah which is why they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, this one, I'm very surprised to see this one near the end because, boy, they have passed over painters like this over and over and over and over again. There's just nothing nothing I could, I'm going to remember about that painting. This one, it's fine. I real, uh, So um, since I know from the... Well, we're now we're going to look at the painting side, side by side. What I mean by that is we get to see the painting of the artist on the left where they had the t all the time to complete, and then the one they had in four hours. This woman did a great job. Uh, she can, she it wouldn't, uh, I'm, I, I'm excited about seeing more from her, and, um, and I'm looking forward to her competing against more traditional types of painters. So, um, because this is kind of the language I speak, a little bit more simplistic and leaning toward abstract all the emphasis on negative space and forms and the space between things as opposed to eyelashes. This woman is not going to be painting eyelashes and you're not going to see me painting eyelashes either. This one, oh, that's interesting. So the one she did in four hours today is as unrealized in terms of being finished as the one she did on the left. So it leaves me not knowing what she's capable of doing. And for a gallery commission, you know, a $10,000 commission of a famous person that's going to go on a gallery wall. You have to remember the context. The context it's going into is a gallery. You know, if you put one of my pieces of art in a gallery, boy, is it going to look way different than it would if you put it in a coffee shop. I'm just saying the venue really matters. And I don't think that's going to hold up. Oh, this was the storyteller. Yeah, I can see why they would choose this fella. Maybe not so much for the painting that he did today, as much as the potential of what he might do when it comes to seeing more of his work or his body of work. But it all depends on whether or not he makes it through this episode into the finals. So we're about to find that out. So now we're at that place where these three artists are ready for the final judging. And only one will go on to compete in the finals. Uh, or what they call the semifinals. So let's see. There they are. Very different paintings. But I stand by the one on the left. Uh, I'm excited about that one more than the others. It's it's singularly different than than what we've seen in uh, in the episode so far. The winner is dun da 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 da. Okay, I'm holding my breath because um, I almost never agree with who they say. But I'm going to be great. Oh, hello. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> Yay! Get to see more from this person. I'm looking forward to this. So remember to keep the whites of your paper white, your paints wet, mass for value, mix for color, and that's mass for value, meaning find all your values, and then mix color to insert into those masses, rather than uh, not mixing. You gotta mix. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye.